G'day everyone, Leo here from the Australian Marine Conservation Society. Hope you're all doing well in these very unpredictable times and looking after yourselves. So we thought here at Australian Marine Conservation Society, we'd, we'd help entertain you while you're at home, either working or playing. And for the next half an hour or so, we're gonna talk about Aussie sharks and rays. So as I mentioned, my name's Leo. This here is Timmy the tiger shark. He'll pop in every now and then. Um, and yeah, just a little bit of housekeeping, just maybe bear with us if there's any technical glitches of any sort. Facebook's been a bit um, a bit crazy lately. And also uh, just with the internet connection with everyone working, it might be a bit um, uh, a little unstable, but we should be fine. So let's get stuck into this and have a good time and chat about Aussie sharks and rays. And if you just bear with me, actually, I'm just gonna share my screen so you can see these slides. Just hold on one moment. And sorry guys, just one sec. All righty, here we go. So as you can see on uh, this slide here, we're gonna start off by talking about shark evolution. So we're gonna get a sense of where sharks have come from. And then from that, we're gonna understand a little bit about their life history, how in some respects sharks are actually similar to us humans. Um, we're, gonna, we're then gonna look at how sharks are really important to healthy oceans and then get into the meat of it and actually meet some really cool Aussie sharks that aren't found anywhere else in the world, but here. Um, and then following all that, um, and once we're all inspired and falling in love with sharks, we can then um, have a look at some ways you can help sharks, not just here in Australia, but also across the world and wherever you may be from. So let's jump into shark evolution. Now, the most amazing thing about shark evolution that I find is that they've been around for about 450 million years. And on top of that, they've survived five of the Earth's mass extinctions. So if you have a look on this slide here, you'll see these extinction events on the left-hand side with the stars. Um, and that green circle there is basically when our sharks and rays first appeared. So as we said, about 450 or million years ago. Then our modern day sharks and rays, or all the living sharks and ray species that we know of today, appeared around 250, 60 year, million years ago. So where that blue circle is, um, and the most recent branch um, are the rays, the Batioidea, um, and they appeared around about 145, 150 odd million years ago. Now, one thing that makes sharks and rays so amazing um, is that, like I said, they've, they've survived five mass extinction events. Believe it or not, it was this extinction event here around the Permian where about 90 odd percent of all life on earth was wiped out. So it kind of really makes you wonder how on earth did sharks and rays survive or sharks in this particular sense here, rays hadn't appeared yet. Um, and, and one of the thinkings is, is that sharks during this period and continue to evolve to fill a range of um, gaps or niches in nature. And as they evolve to fill these gaps, they become masters of their respective domains. Not only that, but they also occupy all the levels in the water column um, from swimming at the surface right down to waters that are over a thousand meters deep. So because they're able to fill so many niches or these gaps and they occupy such large extents of the water column, they're able to, I suppose, escape um, impacts that might affect certain areas or another or certain animals or another. So in some way, shape or form, they've persisted um, and it truly is one of nature's absolutely brilliant stories. Um, and to give you an example of how sharks and rays like today appear in all different shapes and sizes and functions and are found in different parts. I'm actually gonna show you two shark jaws that I managed to obtain during my research. So rest assured, these are shark jaws were obtained ethically um, as a result of my research. No sharks were sort of harmed in this process, I guess. Um, the first one is the broadnose seven gill. Uh, now this shark here, if you can see the teeth there, actually I think, believe it or not, yeah, there we go. Broadnose seven gill. It's got a very weird looking jaw. Um, this shark here was, I, I found it in Victoria. Um, and what you'll notice is you've got some sharp teeth designed for puncturing sort of small and medium sized fish and some teeth at the top with serrations to kind of dice their way through. Um, and one thing sharks are famous for is having numerous rows of teeth, which you can kind of see in there. The other shark draw I've got is much smaller. Now this is from a gummy shark, uh, which is found in Southern Australian waters. And what you'll notice here is they've got plates. Um, so they're not like your conventional teeth, so to speak. Um, and these plates, many rays have teeth almost effectively the same as these. And these are designed to crunch and grind down 
on hard bodied animals like, like crabs and other crustaceans. And a little fun fact, gummy sharks love the taste of squid. Um, so yeah, so as we can see, sharks, a range of forms, sizes, shapes, um, they've lasted quite a long time and fingers crossed we'll hope to do so for many more millions of years to come. And as we move forward, we'll, we'll learn, sorry, one second. So as we said, or as I was going to explain, in a lot of ways, sharks are actually like us. Yes, they're fish and obviously we're not fish, but um, like us humans, they live pretty long lives into the decades. Uh, the longest living shark, believe it or not, is a Greenland shark, which I think lives up to about 400 years, which is just mind boggling. So there's perhaps a shark swimming out there today that has seen empires rise and fall and is still cruising. Um, but as I said, they live long lives. They're typically slow to mature. So they don't mature until they're quite a few years old and they give birth to relatively few young compared to other fish. So we're talking about young that are perhaps anywhere from one to two to perhaps maybe in the tens or twenties. And that's about it. Most sharks will actually give birth. So around about 65% of sharks and, uh, sharks and rays give birth to live young. Uh, the remainder lay eggs, funnily enough. Um, and another really cool fact that absolutely boggled me when I first learned it um, when I was a kid is that some sharks actually have warm blood. Um, and these are the laminid sharks. So the laminid sharks are the famous great white shark, uh, the mako shark, and perhaps some of the ones you're not so familiar with like the poor beagle and the salmon shark. So these sharks have warm blood, which has enabled them to occupy pretty much any ocean in the world in the cool temperate waters and being warm blooded makes them uh, more active and more efficient predators too. So we touched on reproduction and how they live a long time um, and they're slow to mature and give birth to a few young. And I'm gonna introduce you to a shark called the dusky shark. Now the dusky shark is found in waters across the world, um, but we're gonna have a look at a specific example from Western Australia. Now, the dusky shark is, it's very much like a human in the sense that I find a lot of parallels and it kind of reminds me why sharks are so important to protect and why they're so vulnerable. Um, and that is with the dusky shark, females sexually mature when they're about 18 or so years old. Um, and males at about 14 or 15. So humans sexually mature probably in their early teens, maybe 10, 11, 12 boys, about 13. So as you can see, these duskies take quite a while to become sexually mature. On top of that, dusky sharks um, can be pregnant for up to two years. So they're carrying around a baby or babies for up to two years. And then because of all the energy invested in raising their young and, and, and giving birth to their young, they then need, the mothers then need another year effectively just to recover from that so that they can then be prepared for the next reproductive cycle. So all in all, a reproductive cycle for dusky whalers is probably going to take about three years. And if you look at dusky whalers in WA, so Western Australia, which is the Western portion of Australia, obviously, um, basically dusky sharks will make seasonally movements north and south. So when they're ready to give birth, they'll start making their way down south um, and they'll give birth in the southern portions of WA. Um, and then the juveniles, uh, once they reach more of an adult stage, will then start making their way back up north. Now, there's a round trip of around 3,000 kilometres. So as you can see, they occupy quite a lot of waters and you can probably find them cruising just off the coast of Ningaloo Reef, which is one of the world's most magnificent places on earth, um, right down south of WA. So they travel a long distance. Um, and really do exemplify why sharks are so magnificent and need our care. Now sharks, as I touched on earlier, are incredibly important to healthy oceans. Uh, they're what we call keystone species that keep food webs in check. Um, if you're not too familiar with what a keystone is, it actually comes from the concept of an archway. So the keystone in an archway uses gravity uh, to basically hold an arch together and support the weight above it. Um, and if you remove that keystone, that arch falls and so does the bridge. So a similar concept in nature where with the keystone species, if you remove that from the environment, you're gonna affect all the life around it um, in, in ways that are perhaps unpredictable. And sharks occupy that role. Um, sharks also work in very complex ways too. They have, sorry, they have a complex way of interacting with the environment. It's very dynamic. Um, and they also are part of what's called a landscape of fear. Now this phenomenon, the landscape of fear is basically how predators or apex predators can influence the behavior of other animals around them and by extension, how those animals interact with the environment. 
And this is true, not just in the water, but also on land. Um, and as a little side effect of this landscape of fear, sharks can actually be climate change heroes, which I'll touch on just after we watch this short video. So this landscape of fear video, um, credit goes to Mario Espinoza. Um, his Twitter handle is just down there. And what you'll notice here, um, actually, you know what? I'm not even gonna talk about it. I'm gonna let you watch it and enjoy it. And here we go. So as you can see, even Timmy got a bit scared of that. But um, what you can see there is, is a tiger shark, and what looks like a white tip shark of some sort, has come into this bruv, which is a baited remote underwater video. Um, and this tiger shark has come in and has actually influenced how that other shark behaves. Because that other shark is more concerned with its survival um, than investigating what might be a food source. Now I'll touch on how they're climate change heroes. Um, and how this works is that basically, for example, in WA, um, there's, there's, there's tiger sharks and dugongs and big seagrass meadows. Um, and tiger sharks, well, they're climate change heroes in some respect. And as you can see, Timmy's <laughs> quite excited about it. But um, how this works is what happens is, is that a tiger shark will, will come into an area where a dugong might be, you know, happily munching away on some seagrass. And this dugong, you know, it's living its best life. and um, the slightest sense that there's a tiger shark around, Dugong goes, crap, I better not worry so much about eating and better kind of keep my eyes out and make sure that I'm not the one that's, you know, going to be eaten. So the Dugong will move on and it won't eat as much seagrass in certain areas. And the tiger shark comes in and it does its thing. Now, how this helps climate change is that seagrass is a really important store of carbon from the atmosphere and it stores carbon 40 times faster than rainforests. So if less seagrass is getting eaten and more is able to stay within the ecosystem, then we're able to draw down more carbon. And that's how sharks can help us with climate change. Another interesting thing is that the shark is actually looking after the little guys. So seagrass meadows are very important nursery habitats for a range of small animals, including smaller fish and small sharks. So there we have it. So sharks do quite a lot for us. Okay. So let's move into sharks uh, in an Australian context. Now, Australia, I'm proud of where I live. Our, our natural environment is, frankly, second to none. We're one of the lucky countries in that respect. But when it comes to sharks and rays, um, over a quarter of the, around about a quarter of the world species call our waters home. Um, and of those species, so there's 322 or so species that, that swim in our waters, and of those, around about half are found nowhere else in the world. So they're endemic. Um, and as you can see here on the slide, 39% of sharks live in Australia and nowhere else. And around about 69% of all our ray species live here and nowhere else. So Australia is this really unique spot um, with a lot of diversity um, in sharks and rays. And let's just touch on some of the, a few true blue Aussies. Um, so these are some of the species that perhaps you've never heard of. Um, believe it or not, some of them I didn't really know a lot about until I started with Australian Marine Conservation Society and really had to dig into the nitty gritty of, of sharks in Australia and how they're affected. So first up the rank, we've got the green eye spur dog. Um, this is a super cute shark. Um, you can tell that there's, there's a lovely drawing there by Emily Donoghue who crafted our shark posters, but you'll also notice that below that is um, I suppose a real life picture of what it looks like. Now, green eye spur dogs have these iridescent green eyes and they help it see in the pitch black depths of where it lives. So it lives on the continental around in the continental shelf of Southern Australia. So from like Victoria through Tasmania and Western Australia. Um, and these waters can get up, to, where it lives can get up to about 1300 meters deep. So over a kilometer, just shy of a mile for those using the Imperial system. Um, and these green eyes um, help it see as much light and help it detect prey and also avoid um, predators. But the quirkiest thing is, is that this animal has probably the longest pregnancy of any species. And recent studies, have shown that it can probably be pregnant for around about three whole years. And after those three years, it'll start breeding again. <clears throat> and as a result, like we mentioned earlier, how they're slow to breed and slow to grow. Um, this is probably one of the reasons why they've become endangered um, because they're vulnerable to deep water trawling in Southern Australia. Um, and as such, because we know, little, we know so little about these sharks and how they use the environment, um, they're particularly vulnerable. 
But yeah, has a pregnancy three whole years. That just blows me out of the water. Another, this one's probably the quirkiest of the lot, if you ask me personally, and that's a white fin swell shark. So as the name suggests, when this shark starts to feel threatened, it'll actually swallow water to blow itself up to make it look bigger. Um, so that'll either scare off predators, <clears throat> excuse me, or actually make itself a little bit more difficult to eat. Um, these sharks actually lay eggs. They don't give birth to live young, <coughs> excuse me. They don't give birth to live young, they lay eggs. Now, in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the egg of a draft board shark. Now, it's not the white fin swell shark. It's a, it's a species of the same family. It's a coastal species. Um, I've come across several of them in my life. Often recreational fishers will catch them. And as you can see, that's what their, their egg case looks like. And the white fin swell shark, though it's not exactly the same, it's a very similar shape and size. <coughs> Excuse me. And very much like the green eye spur dog, it lives in the deep waters and as a consequence is vulnerable to trawling. And again, because we don't know too much about it, um, as a result, it's become critically endangered because of fishing pressure. The Morgie and Skate. Now, not only is this a true blue Aussie, but this is a true blue Tasmanian. And I'll get to that in a second. So the Morgie and Skate is a living dinosaur um, in the sense that it, it's thought that this skate was actually swimming around when T-Rex was stomping his feet. Um, so this skate's been around for quite a while. <coughs> Excuse me. And it lives in just a small pocket of the world in a remote region of Tasmania. Um, and before I actually get to that map and show you exactly where it is, cool fact is that skates are the only rays that lay eggs. All other rays give birth to live young. Um, and unfortunately the Morkian skate is endangered um, and its primary threat is reduced water quality. Um, that's from um, mining and water runoff, but I suppose more alarmingly is the intensive salmon farming that occurs in its habitat. Um, so the environment, so I'll go to the map now. And what you'll see is, is that Tasmania is the southernmost sort of main island of Australia. And it's literally just in this little pocket here called Macquarie Harbour. Um, it was previously in Bathurst Harbour, which is a bit further south, uh, but it hasn't been seen there in 20 odd years. Uh, but here is where they do a lot of the salmon farming. Now the water here is naturally low in oxygen. And what intense salmon farming does is that because of the fish waste, um, bacteria eat that fish waste and decompose it, which then uses up more oxygen. So they're facing a threat from intensive aquaculture, um, but also around the area from mining um, and water quality and other sources of pollutants coming in. Um, and as I said, you know, it's, it's a shame that they're only found in this little pocket in the world and they really need a helping hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. My favorite species of shark or ray is the fiddler ray. Um, sometimes people call them banjo sharks as well. And the reason they call them that is because they look like half a shark, half a ray. Now, this is my favorite. I worked very closely um, on fiddler rays during my PhD. I looked at their reproduction and how the stress of fishing, fishing um, affects their reproduction, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, but fiddler rays are found in the southern portions of Australia and up into New South Wales. There's two species, the southern fiddler ray and the eastern fiddler ray. Um, and there is an extremely rare colour morph that lives in South Australia called the magpie ray. Now, I say it was called the magpie ray because it was thought to be a separate species altogether. But through DNA testing about, uh, I think, oh, geez, maybe four or five years ago. Anyway, pretty recent DNA testing showed that this colour morph here, this black and white one, is actually the southern fiddler ray. But it's very rare. I think there's only ever been two species caught, um, uh, sorry, two individuals caught. And on top of that, they're probably only found in the Gulf of St. Vincent in and around Kangaroo Island. So again, like the Morgan Skate, a very, very small pocket. Um, but as I said, I looked at these guys during my PhD um, and I had a look at how stress affects their reproduction. Now, remember how we said the sharks are similar to us in some respects? Um, their physiology when they're pregnant actually is showing similar signs to us as well and how humans respond to stress um, during pregnancy and giving birth to their offspring. So what I found was is that trawled mums, when they're pregnant, actually give birth to smaller offspring and the mums have a lower body weight afterwards. Um, and this has implications for sharks that do survive capture and their survival. Exactly what that means, we don't know yet, but knowing what humans are like when babies are born undersized and mums have a lower weight after birth, it is a health concern of sorts. But to give you a bit of an indication, believe it or not, I've got some, some examples here. So this here, uh, this here is uh, three of their embryos. Um, 
And again, some of these were unfortunately aborted uh, because of the stress. Um, but again, everything was performed under ethics and the animals were looked after as nicely as possible. Uh, but yeah, tiny little embryos there. Um, and they grow up and they're born at that size there. So they're actually carbon copies of their parents. Um, this one here is probably about the size of my hand, which is a bit hard to tell on the screen, but as you can see, quite cute. Little mouths, little gills. Um, and that's what they look like there. Super, super funny was that during this study, um, one mum actually aborted one of her embryos um, and I didn't notice it until the morning. And I had a look and it looked really odd. And it wasn't until I scooped it out that I realised it was actually a two-headed embryo. Um, I couldn't believe it and I've got it right here. So it's a bit decomposed. It might be hard to see here, but give it a bit of a shake. It's a bit hard to see, but you might be able to tell that there and there are two little mouths. And from the top, uh, a bit hard to see, but there's a black spot here, which is the eye. And another black spot there, which is the eye, the other one. So yeah, two-headed embryo. This does happen. How it happens, I have no idea. Um, genetic defect, who knows? Um, if anyone out there knows, I'd love to hear it. Um, so yeah, so really cool species. Again, only found in Australia. The other question I suppose you might be asking is, well, are sharks and rays in trouble? Um, tragically and unfortunately, yes. Um, so this is from the IUCN Red List that basically assesses all the life on earth and assesses to what degree and what species are facing the risk of extinction. And what you'll notice is for sharks and rays, it's about 30% of all living species are facing the threat of extinction. Um, and sadly, this is one of the highest of all forms of marine life. Um, as you'll notice on this list, the only other form of marine life are reef corals um, and sharks and rays are closely behind. Um, you've got mammals like bears, lions and tigers, which are threatened in their own rights. But as you can see, 25%, 34% for some plants. But yeah, sharks and rays are up there. Um, and rays even more so, funnily enough. Um, in a lot of ways, they've kind of been neglected, largely out of disinterest. They live in deeper water. We don't terribly know much about them. Um, but suffice to say, globally, this is requiring an effort. And although in Australia, compared to the rest of the world, we're doing okay in terms of our shark and ray conservation, there's a lot of room for improvement. And as we've just seen, there are quite a few species, um, or half of our species actually aren't found anywhere else and the ones you've just seen. So if we can't protect them here in Australia, and if we can't put the, me the, the mechanisms in place to protect them, then quite frankly, no one will or can. Um, so it really is up to us um, to, to do this. And this is the current the work I'm involved in at the moment. And it's, it's something that we definitely need public support on um, to help us with our campaign. So there's a lot of ways you can help. Um, probably the two best ways is one, join Shark Champions. So the links for, all, the links for Shark Champions um, will be in the comments. And Shark Champions is a joint campaign between ourselves and Humane Society International. Um, Shark Champions is looking at protecting Australia's sharks and rays over the next few years. And we need more champions to come on board to help spread the shark love, to become more informed and really, you know, stand up for those that, that they can't kind of stand up for themselves because, well, maybe because they've got fins. But anyway, help sharks and rays along. Um, join me for the ride. It's super fun. It, it, it's a tough fight, but it's definitely one worth it. And I know I'm going to be proud of it for the rest of my life. Uh, the other way you can also help um, is you can donate. Um, if you've got some extra coins, even if it's just 10 bucks and everyone chips in, this goes a long way to help kickstart more of our vital work that'll be happening this year and into the years ahead. And as I said, some links on how to do this um, will be in the comments. I should also mention um, that with regards to your comments, unfortunately, I, I can't kind of see them live at the moment, but do write them. I hope you have been writing them and I will endeavour to get to them as soon as I can and reply to as many as I can. Because as I said, I want to know what you guys think. Um, and yeah, and I, I look forward to doing this more often. So by all means, let us know your thoughts. Um, and we'll take it from there. I hope you guys have enjoyed this live stream. I've had a lot of fun. Um, I look forward to doing some more. So if there's any way you think we can improve, by all means, let us know. And um, hopefully we'll see you as a shark champion. So thanks everyone and um, take care. I'll, I guess I'll start answering some comments as soon as I get to them. Cheers. Thanks guys.